and welcome to Mount Kelly Prep Radio's 20 Questions, Episode 12. Today my guest is Nev Fountain. Nev Fountain is a writer and satirist. He writes regularly for The Private Eye, Dead Ringers and Newsoids. He also writes Doctor Who audio plays. As well as this, he has a series of novels called The Mervyn Stone Mysteries. His new book, The Painkiller, is out now. Firstly, do you think that the current political situation in this country and the rest of the world is making it the perfect time for satire? Yes, I'd say it's a perfect time for satire. It's almost a unique time for satire. I don't think we've got as many grotesques on the world stage as we've ever had. Uh, normally it takes months or even years to find an angle on a, on a character or a world leader. But I say Donald Trump, Nigel Farage and people like that seem to be sprung fully formed in, onto, onto the world stage. And um, yeah, it's, it's a great time. Is this showing in sales of magazines like Private Eye? Private Eye is doing as well as it's ever been. I think it's not completely due to the satire, though, but I think satire is an important, is a part of it. They, they, there is a, it is a nice release, having satirical comedy to deliver mm-hmm. to your door. But I think it's because there's so many uh, news outlets are bought by newspaper magnets and companies. People look to Private Eye for the journalism as well and to find actually an honest voice. Not always, it wasn't always the case with Private Eye, but now we seem to be in a unique position where we're the only ones without an angle because we're not owned by anyone in particular. Are politicians like Farage and Trump hard to satirise or easy as they are essentially comic book characters themselves? Well, in a way they're great to satirise, but in this age of Twitter and Facebook, a lot of the jokes are already done. Uh, we, we shouldn't be disheartened by the fact that some jokes are already out there in, in, in the, on the internet. But, uh, but we have to be aware that we have to have a fresh look on what they are doing and be up to the minute and not do the same old jokes that everyone else is doing. Um, they are satirical creatures, but I say looking in, looking in the long sweep of history, we've had people like these before. I think maybe it was just the 80s and 90s that were unique. We just had corporate politicians with no personalities to look at because before that time we had larger-than-life characters all the time, and of which Farage and Trump are, are latest in a long line of weirdos and despots and um, you know people with force of personality to, to, to shove their way up to the top. You look back in the, uh, the 70s and the 60s and you'll have... People like Enoch Powell and and uh, and uh, Nixon, just just people who are just so easy to satirise and, and such you know grotesques, larger than life people who just come back to that point again. How do you divide work between you and Tom Jameson for your many projects, including Dead Ringers? Well, Tom and I work on comedy together. Uh, we tend to sit in the same room when we can, but we can email things backwards and forwards. Back when we were young, in our 20s, we used to sit in the same room and just uh, write a script together. Tom would do a first draft. He'd print it out. I'd put notes on it, send it back to him. He'd write, he'd write it again. we use a lot of paper that way. Nowadays, we just email the scripts to each other and just redraft each other's draft until, until we're happy. For things like Private Eye, which are much quicker, we tend to divide our work. Tom tends to write quick topical jokes and small topical articles. He writes lots and lots of different types of topical jokes. And I tend to sweat out the, the longer columns and things like that, like Jeremy Corbyn or the comic strips such as Miller Bean and the Brunites. I te- that tends to be my responsibility. So I write much less than Tom, but it takes longer for me to do so. What is the difference between writing for a radio programme and a TV programme? Well, a radio programme is, is a bit lonelier. With a television programme, you have a long period of time to do it, and you have lots of people you have to talk to. If you write a script, you have to explain to the costume people what you mean when you, when you put that costume in the script, and the set people, and the producers, and the cast, and you have read-throughs, and it's quite like a, it feels like you're part of a team all the way through. The writing for radio is rather quick. An episode of Dead Ringers can be written and recorded in the space of three days. And most of that time it's me and Tom writing in a room. So it's got more fun uh, with the modern Dead Ringers because we have a lot more younger writers that we can bounce off in, on, in the read-throughs. 
But sometimes, when we did the older Dead Ringers back in the 2000s, it, we did just look at each other in a tiny room, literally, until the time it, it, it came around to record it. Do you have a special place where you write? Well, nowadays I tend to write in the kitchen because I have a because it's nice. There's a nice big window to look out onto the garden, and there's a, a big television set which I can tune to the radio or just have YouTube showing me clips of things just to take my mind off things. Uh, when Tom and I write together, we have a little office in Private Eye which we we um, lobbied for over many years until we finally got a little space in Private Eye to work. Before, we used to sort of squat in any office we could find, mostly in the BBC. We tend to sort of like hide ourselves away for months and months before they discover us. <laughs> and uh, every time we'd, uh, someone would come in the room, we'd brace ourselves to be thrown out, and they just gave us another photocopier, because they weren't quite sure what television programme we were working on. So that was quite fun, but it was a bit of a nomadic existence. <laughs> and when uh, the BBC finally closed down and we finished our last series of ringers, and our last children's series of Scoop, we had no reason to stay, and the BBC was getting sold off anyway, the buildings. So we finally said to Ian, we have to have somewhere to meet. I live out West London, he lives out this way. And uh, after asking a couple of times, we were given a, a tiny, pokey little office, which used to be owned by Paul Foot, well, used to be resided in by Paul Foot, which we cleaned up, and we kind of shared it with a couple of the journalists. And it works very well, Ian's very happy with us having us in the building so he can talk to us about stuff we've written. And uh, it's a good arrangement that works really well now. What do you do when you get writer's block? There's no such thing as writer's block, in my opinion. It's just simply the fear of not writing as well as you can possibly write. If you write something really good, like a really good book, and then you write the next book and, you, and you're worried in your head that it's not going to be as good, that's not writer's block, that's just simply... A disincentive to do what you're supposed to be doing, even though you, even if you're thinking it's not quite as good as what you've done before. It's just a fright that the idea that you're doing is not as good and the way you're writing it is not as good. I mean, I've written a, a book, Painkiller, and now I'm writing the follow-up to it, and I'm worried it's not going to be as good, but I will go through and I will finish it because I think it's a solid idea and, it, and it, it's worth finishing. The key is to start writing and not stop until you've finished. I don't believe in writer's block. You have written Doctor Who audio plays. Why does he as a character have such a fascination for generation after generation? I think Doctor Who, for me, there were two types of superhero when I, uh, when I was growing up. There was the type with the gun and the cocky comments, the hand solos and the Buck Rogers, and there was the other type, the man who used his brain and the man who dressed in amusing clothes. And... Uh, a, a boy of my type, of, uh, of my ideals, naturally gravitated towards Doctor Who. It's no secret that Doctor Who has a huge gay following because Doctor Who is in many ways an outsider who is a gentleman who uses his brain. He's also a sort of a, a composite of every marvellous British hero there has been over the ages. He is the time traveller in H.G. Wells' time machine. He's James Bond, he's Sherlock Holmes. He's Professor Challenger. He's all these types of character. If you have a type of character who uses the gun and just blasts away at things, he is not it. He has so many different types of character, but he is all that type of character. What is your favourite thing about working at Private Eye? I think it's a very friendly place to work. Um, everyone knows everyone else. And Ian, his love, is a joy to work with. He's it's so nice to do the writers' meetings with him because so often you go to a writers' meeting in the television series and the person running the writers' meeting is probably the least funniest person in the room or the slowest person in the room. When we do our, our, our meetings on press day, when we discuss the last-minute jokes and the, the cover, Ian is the sharpest person in the room. And when anything flags, he's always able to sort of produce a joke that we can all hang on the coattails of. Uh, so it's a delight to work with Ian, and it's always a friendly place to go to, it's a nice place to go to, and it's very satisfying to put a magazine to bed knowing he's going to go out over the next 24 hours to the whole country. So it, it's relaxed, it's friendly, and it's very unlike a lot of writing jobs I do, which tend to be 
well, I, well, I used to do television jobs, which used to be kind of unfriendly and competitive and kind of exhausting because you write a lot and you get nowhere. With Private Eye, Ian knows what he wants and he doesn't want to waste time with us writing stuff that he doesn't want to write, want us to write. So we tend to know and tend to be quite focused as well. We have a meeting in the morning, I decide what to do for Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Tom decides what he'd like to do, Ian says OK or no, we go away for a couple of hours and write the last minute jokes. And it's very immediate, a lot like radio, it's a very immediate kind, kind of way of working. Please tell me about your book, The Painkiller. Well, The Painkiller is my first serious thriller. I've done some humorous murder mysteries before with my Mervyn Stone mysteries, but I wanted to write a proper serious thriller. And I wanted to write a different kind of thriller. So my thriller is, is about a woman in pain who discovers her own suicide note in a drawer. So it's all about chronic neuropathic pain. And I wanted to write a thriller about what happens if the person in the middle of the thriller has actually thought about dying anyway. Because most thrillers are about, oh, oh no, someone's trying to kill someone. What if the person in the middle of the book actually wanted to die at some point? And what is the nature of your own life and your own decision to die? Because in the book she has gone up, she's moved on and she doesn't want to, but does her husband want her to die? Is he, is he, is, does he think it's a kindness? So I, I, I'm trying to write, I tried to write a very, very different kind of thriller. And I wrote it under the name NJ Fountain because I wanted to do a different, serious thriller. There's jokes in it, but um, it's going very well and I'm very happy with it. It came out this year. Um, you mentioned earlier that you're writing the sequel. When might this come out? Well, I'm writing the next serious thriller. It can't be a sequel to this one because it's very much its own book. Uh, I'm currently about 60,000 words in, so I have no idea when I'm going to finish. And I have no idea if it's going to be good enough to be published, but I'm, my fingers crossed I hope to finish it in the next couple of months. How do you come up with new ideas for your Jeremy Corbyn columns in The Private Eye? Well, it's, a, it's the embarrassment of riches, really, because Jeremy Corbyn is so rubbish on so many levels. Uh, you just literally have to pick the story that's happening at the time. I went away, I used to do the comic strips, the Millie Beans and the, the Brunites for, for, for Gordon Brown and Ed Miliband. Normally I'd be able to set them an idea on a Wednesday and it would carry through to the following Monday. With Jeremy Corbyn, it pops up, nonsense pops up every day. So Ian likes me to write it on the Monday, on the day we go to press. So uh, the news guides me. At the moment it might be Ken Livingstone, it might be... Uh, all manner of things. It might be his statement on the Syrian bombing. There are so many things that go wrong in his life. It's it's quite easy to to, to find to find something. Sometimes it's quite hard to settle on it. What one thing to do because there are so many silly things happening to him. And it does help that I do have a healthy dislike of the man as well, which kind of helps my satire. So is Corbyn the leader with the most material you've ever had? Well, and I've, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I've been through Blair and Major, and I've been through <laughs> Haig, which was a, was a lot of fun, William Haig, for, for a long time on, on Dead Ringers. I'd say he's the worst party leader, almost, maybe, uh, maybe as bad as Ian Duncan Smith. He's, he's probably the worst Labour leader that's been since... Since the, since the Second World War, it really is quite terrible. Uh, not as funny as William Hague, not as gormless, uh, and really quite nasty as Ian Duncan Smith, but he is terrible in his own unique way. Now on to my ten set questions, which I yeah. ask everybody who joins me on 20 Questions. What is your favourite piece of music? I have so many favourite pieces of music. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Neil Hannon and the Divine Comedy, and I listen to his albums all the time, especially when I'm working. I love musicals. I think I do love Les Miserables, and uh, I love the uh, the, um, the, uh, the the song sung by the, the villain called Stars, which is a very beautiful song. I always think it's amazing that the most beautiful song in Les Mis is sung by the 
the nastiest person. And uh, I do like a little bit of opera sometimes. And uh, I like to sing Holst the Planets and uh, Les Miserables. That's, that's a special. And, uh, sorry, I like to sing, uh, I like to, like, like Carmen, because um, I, I do that at school. So I know it very well. If you could invite three people, dead or alive, to a dinner party, who would you choose and why? I'd probably like to talk to Stan Laurel, because I always think he'd be a, a very nice man to talk to. I also think he'd be a clever man to talk to as well. He seemed very gentle and very much the creative force behind Laurel and Hardy. For the same reason, I'd like to talk, I'd like to, talk to Boris Karloff too. I always thought he was, he was, a, he was an actor very underrated actor and he seemed like a bit of a gentleman to me. I'd like to talk to Boris Karloff and I'd like to talk to Peter Ustinov as well because he was such a raconteur. I think everybody, every modern uh, intelligent man like Stephen Fry wants to be Peter Ustinov because he had such an interesting life and I saw him once at the Palladium with my mother and he was just one man on the stage just telling stories about his life and he was very, very funny. So I think Boris Karloff, Stan Laurel and P.C. Ustinov. What is your favourite piece of literature and why? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think probably The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the one I've gone back to again and again. If you can call it literature, I suppose it is now. It's probably 30, 40 years old now. Uh, there's so much in it. Um... Other ones I really like, uh, pieces of literature, I like The War of the Worlds, it's a great reread, good to reread. Uh, I also like J.D. Salinger, um, fantastic stuff to read. Uh, yeah, just you know, stuff that has a lot in it, and uh, Catch-22 has a lot in it, I, I like to reread bits of that. But Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is something I return to more than any other piece of writing. Where is your favourite place and why? My favourite place? Yes. In the world? Anywhere you want. (laughs) Probably home. It's a very nice house. I live in a very nice house and it's a very peaceful village. And I love coming home. Uh, I think home is the best place. What is your favourite piece of art and why? Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Um, I do like Gustav Klimt, but that's a bit of a cliche these days. I do like his, his use of colour and texture. Uh, I do like Magritte as well. Uh, and I, I like, um, yeah, I think, um, it's a cliche, but I do like Gustav Klimt, especially the kiss. I think it's a nice piece of piece of art. What is the best piece of advice you have ever been given? I think the best piece of advice was given to me when I was eight years old, and I was on a trampoline in a in a leisure centre somewhere on the south coast, uh, some kind of Butlins place, and the man running the trampoline had just had a row with his girlfriend, and he said to me, "Listen to me, son." Never get involved with women. And I completely ignore that advice, but I do remember it <laughs> for some reason. So I think that's the best piece of advice because I've never forgotten it, even though I've never taken <laughs> taken, it, taken the advice of it. If you weren't a writer and satirist, what do you think you would be? I think I can't not be a writer. I think I'd be someone writing in another job. In my time, I've been a teacher, I've worked in a toy shop, I've worked in a ticket agency, I've worked in every kind of job. I think if I wasn't a professional writer, which I am now, I'd be a writer in my spare time. And uh, I'd be a frustrated writer because I'd probably have to, you know, write around the job that I'm doing. What do you think your greatest achievement has been? I think my greatest achievement is what I, was, I, I mentioned in the last answer. I, I have achieved what I always wanted to do. I have been a professional writer now for almost 20 years, and it's something I never dreamed of doing. 
to that level. And it's something I aspire to. And I made so many mistakes and so many wrong turns in the, when I was in my 20s to try and write. And try to find a, a type of writing which I could excel at until I settled on radio and then as a career. And then I found Private Eye. I think my achievement is to be carrying on doing what I've always loved to do and I've done it exclusively for almost 20 years now. What do you love doing the most? Writing? Um, I like going to the theatre. I like going out to a restaurant and maybe seeing a movie. Um, yeah, and I like walking the dog. But I also do like to write. Which is, I also don't like to write because most writers don't like to write, but I also do like to do it. And I like um, just going into work, into private eye, and seeing my writing partner and, and, and seeing the people who work there. And it's, it's, it's all. I like everything I do, which is horrible for some people, but I do like everything I do. Finally, do you have a hobby or secret talent? Um, I do like to sing. I used to do a lot of musicals. And uh, I appeared in some opera and some Gilbert and Sullivan when I was at school and university. And I used to sing in a Christmas choir down in Cornwall. So I do like singing, and I sing a lot as I walk around the house. And I do, uh, I, I pride myself on having a, quite a good voice. And when I, when I use it properly, I can sing a, a good tune. Thank you for joining me on 20 Questions. Well, thank you for having me. Bye.